Welcome everybody to another live Marketing Experiments web clinic. I am standing in for Flint today. He had to take a flight to New York uh, just yesterday, but we've got the whole team here. We've got uh, everybody in the studio, plus we have a team uh, of uh, folks on the line, um, both online, um, just waiting for your questions if you have any. And uh, we're really excited today to present to you some research that's been kind of in the making. Um, if you're on this webinar, then I'm guessing that you're um, probably one of the smart ones. Um, I'm, there's no guessing about it, you are, because this is about a topic that I would say is, is not beginning, it's more intermediate. And it's typically the marketers that I run across that get it, that understand that marketing and messaging is not so black and white, especially uh, given the constraints that you have to work in uh, on the sites that you're dealing with and the CMSs, uh, et cetera. So today we're gonna talk about what to do about that. Today we're gonna talk about dealing with multiple personas. It's a question I get every single time we have an event, I'm a marketing trip, a summit, and it's usually from folks who either take the training or are very experienced and they said, listen, I understand this, but I don't understand how to put all this together given the situation that I have. My goal at the end of this clinic is to give you some insights that we uncovered from doing a meta-analysis uh, on the, both the kind of foundational level, so you can have a framework to understand it and transfer it, and then on the tactical level, meaning exactly where does it occur on the page and what can I do about it. If you're on Twitter, please join in. Um, uh, join in on the conversation. I'm really glad that you're here. This isn't the kind of webinar where we just talk. We'd like to get your feedback. I'll be looking for your feedback shortly and throughout the clinic, so please, get on ha hashtag web clinic or use your Q&A feature on GoToWebinar. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, I've been with Mech Labs for probably six and a half years. Um, I spent a number of those years conducting research. Uh, I've probably overseen maybe 10% of the library. Uh, it's been a great privilege and honor, and I'm really excited to share with you what we've discovered today. So uh, with that, I'd like to start with an experiment. This, is an organization that offers minimally invasive medical treatment for people suffering from chronic pain. And what we've done is we've taken steps to anonymize the, kind of the, the critical project details but allow you to get the best out of this experiment. Their goal was simply to increase the leads that they were getting from their website. Our research question, which of these pages in, in site in general will generate the highest lead conversion rate? Let's go ahead and start with version A. So here we've got version A on our right, um, and let's go ahead and scroll down to see the entire page. We've got a you know, headline, introducting copy, a call to action above the fold, and then as we scroll down, you can see we've got some supporting content there for folks. Now, let's take a look at version B. Here, uh, we have something different. We still have headline, and, and, but we don't have any introduction copy. We actually have three evenly weighted columns, each with the links, and then the call to action is here below the fold. So uh, audience, I wanna ask you, which one would you vote for? Version B, version B, okay? Version B, I've got version B. We've got a lot of folks uh, choosing on version B, okay? All right, very good. So uh, let's see the results. For those that chose version B, you are correct. Maybe you've been on some previous webinars, um, but uh, it really brings up an interesting question. Why? Why is it that a page, and let's go back for a second, why is it a page that looks seemingly uh, different from the kind of patterns that we're used to in landing page optimization would win? For example, here's some familiar behavior patterns. As you can see, in each of these examples on the screen, we've got uh, the top one, from this to this, from this to this, from this to this. We're kind of eliminating multiple options, all in most cases equally weighted, in the favor of one option, and they actually outperformed. The, the single options outperform the multiple options. So my question is, is this. What was different in this situation? What, is it, what was it that was different in kind of this page? And I'd like to answer that question uh, in this clinic. 
So first, uh, I'd like to give you a framework for understanding kind of what we've discovered, and it's this. Messaging is naturally ordered into four stages. One, to listen, to attract, to converse, and to nurture. And the order is just as important as the activity. So for example, you can't converse before you attract, and you can't attract before you listen. So um, let me give you an example. Um, I see this happen a lot in relationships, and um, what's interesting is uh, this happens a lot to me. Um, you'd figure that if you're married, you're almost guaranteed conversation, right? Because you've already attracted. Well, this is what it's ended up happening. Is I might come home one day, and, and this, actu- this, this has happened <laughs> multiple times. So another day at the lab, I get home, and, and um, I immediately, I can tell that my wife is upset. And so I want to go up to her. I want to have a conversation, and I say, Joyce, what's wrong? She's like, nothing, nothing at all. And, and she just kind of walks away. And, and I don't know about you, but uh, what I've learned is that when, <laughs> when my spouse says nothing, it really means something. So uh, I continue to say, how can I get her to talk to me? So, so the, the next thing I did is like, hey, listen, I, I brought dinner home and all this. We don't have to like cook or do anything else. We're going to save time, relax. And she just gives me the look. Have you ever received that look before? I, I, terrible. I, it, it just, it's kind of like a mixture between uh, pain and disgust and uh, I can't believe you. So I continue trying. Um, I say, well, uh, well, well, you should talk to me. <laughs> and of course, that just makes things worse. And then finally, I get to the point where I'm like, okay, listen, I, I'm, whatever it was I did, I'm sorry. I just, I really want to listen to you. I want to understand what's wrong. And what do I get? She's like, well, you never listen to me. And, and that's the kind of thing that happens uh, in these situations as well, is we get caught up in this thing where we're not necessarily listening to the feedback that we're getting from customers on all these different data points. For example, in this particular treatment, or this particular situation, this control, the research partner group that we're working with were very intelligent, they're very smart, and they're good marketers. Uh, but what was interesting is that they're so busy um, that they didn't have the opportunity to really listen to their customers. It was just kind of out of their reach. And so we took the opportunity, we got feedback from the service reps from sales, uh, we did a data metrics analysis, we looked at the existing customer research, and what we discovered was that there's a possibility that there may be multiple groups of people coming at the page at the same time and the page isn't serving all but maybe one, maybe one of those groups of people. So our team came up with a hypothesis. What is the effect of providing multiple paths for each of those groups of customers? And and this is kind of uh, the answer to the question that I get a lot uh, from folks. How do we know which prospects to focus on? How do we know how to choose that? And the answer is, is by listening, by taking a look at all of the data that you have and then coming to a hypothesis conclusion about how you can group those prospects based on their commonalities. Which leads me to the next point. To enable conversation with different customers that are all arriving at the same intersection, uh, you know, your page, you've got to alter the geography of the page in a way that attracts each group into its own conversation. It's almost like you have to treat them like individuals. Uh, So for example, how did that end up happening in the treatment? When you take a look at these three columns, you could argue that they're evenly weighted on the page, and in fact they are. They're meant to be evenly weighted in the page. But in the mind, they're not. To the mind of the customers, it is not evenly weighted. In fact, um, this reminds me of a recent experiment I did with my nine-month-year-old daughter. I was uh, asking her, actually, (laughs) I can't ask her anything because she can't speak, but I wanted to discover what her favorite color was. And so we took her here, and we had two uh, flowers. They were both kind of handcrafted with tissue paper, both equal in size, equal in everything except the color. And we presented them to her equally, and after about a second or two, she reached for the purple one. 
And my wife got excited because that's her favorite color. And so I was like, but my sample size isn't big enough. So I continued to test, switching them, making sure that it wasn't anything else. And, and again and again, we confirmed that purple is her favorite color. And it was something that she recognized. Even though they're evenly weighted, it only took her a second or two to make that decision. And she's nine months old. We have adults, we have people coming to these pages, and they're looking immediately for that thing that connects with them. And that's what we did here. The content is not equal in the mind. That was the key. Which brings me to the next question then, how do I write from design for a page that serves multiple visitors with varying interests? Well, the good news is, is that uh, because we get at this question a lot, uh, we went in and our team did a meta-analysis of the entire library. Uh, looking at pages that really have this challenge of very distinct visitor groups with very different needs. And from that analysis, we actually uncovered some common copywriting design adjustments that you can make that often result in the kind of gains that you're looking for. So what I want to do today is I want to give you those tactical changes. But first, before I give you those tactical changes, I want to give you a framework in which to understand them. So that way you can identify them more easily on your pages and your paths. Let's start with the first. Let's start with design. So uh, with the design changes, the first thing that we need to understand is this, that the marketer's goal is not simplicity. It's clarity. Simplicity is just a means to the latter. And uh, this might not make sense at all. I mean, uh, we've, we've heard Joni Ives and Apple and his wonderful accent and his wonderful presentation. It's all about simplicity. But what we've discovered is that simplicity is just one tool. And clarity is kind of the ultimate end. Let me kind of give you an example. Uh, uh, but first, let me review one more point. The reason why simplicity isn't the goal is because in some cases it can obscure clarity. Uh, and, and when I say clarity, I mean relative to the prospect's understanding of the marketer's offer. So let's take a look here. Audience, I want to ask you a question. How would you increase the search volume on this page? Here we've got a site. Um, it's French, but it's a flight site. So think of like an Expedia, think of like um, all these different things. How would you increase the search volume on this page? And I'm, I'm looking at the q and I'm looking at the function, let me know. And I'm watching, I'm waiting for it. Too busy, remove the clutter, okay? Larger and a clear search bar. One search box says John. Do I have any others for the audience? More graphics, okay? Let's take a look at what the team hypothesized. The team hypothesized, very similar to what the, some of the comments I was getting from the audience, is that by giving it more of a Google-like search experience, simplifying it to one thing, just search, that we would increase the search volume. What was the result? A decrease. And not just, this isn't just small, this is significant. This is all of the traffic. So imagine Expedia getting this kind of a decrease. That could take a terrible hit. And what was really interesting is that this particular treatment only performed uh, significantly better during one kind of time of the year, and you can make that guess. We're going to understand later why the difference was this. But uh, let's talk about some of the changes you can make. So these are design changes, and what I mean by this is template changes. If you have the ability and power to make changes to your pages, then there are three types of pages that we've discovered that can really make a difference. The first one is the number of conversion paths. The second one is the availability of subheadlines and headers to give the visitors instructional guidance. And then thirdly, the sequence of the content. So let's look at some examples of these kind of changes uh, in uh, some of the tests that we pulled out from the meta-analysis. First, here we've got uh, a popover to uh, a kind of a, a page that looks like a Windows phone. I mean, it was a, it was, there's just a lot going on. The popover is a way kind of to focus the audience. And here we've kind of got a single path. And as you could see, um, there are a lot of things that they could get. I'm just kind of reading off the page, live Forex and equity demos, live webinars, um, a, a user's forum, and a, a wizard to set up a live account. So 
What would you do, audience, uh, if you could change the template to enable it to speak to multiple customer types? Let's just assume there were two or three. What would you do? Okay. Uh, so let's see what the team of the analysts did. The first thing that they did was they discovered the optimal number of paths. So here we've gone from one path to three paths. And what was interesting about it is this is using the same exact text from the main area. And then in addition, they utilized the header to be instructional. What was the result? 25% increase in clicks. Let's take a look at another example. Here, this is TP1315. Um, we've got a page, easy to use email marketing, um, simple and expensive, professional, free, free 30-day trial, then you've got small business organizations, large, synod campaign now, and then the basics of marketing. What did our team do? Well, first, they optimized the number of paths. So here, we've reduced the paths from probably five to two, based on the commonalities of the groups, and then, we added an explanation subheadline. We used the same exact text, um, added a subheadline to help explain the process, and the result 32% more conversions. Let's look at another example. Here, we've got five options, five different things that you can do, and in fact, it's, it's probably more like six. Our team hypothesized that you didn't really need this much at this point, but there were two kind of groups of people. So, what they did, was they reduced them, we reduced them and then consolidated them, and then utilized the headers for explanation. What was the result? 63% increase in conversions. So that's all the way down at the end of the path. One page actually impacting the path. Let's look at uh, two more, uh, one more example for this particular point. So here I'm actually waiting on the test protocol number. Um, this is a, a test that um, I've examined the data and we validated. Uh, we actually resequenced the content, adjusted the color so that the visitors would actually look at the content, and then finally added a, a headline and subheadline that was instructional. What was the result? 181% increase in click through. And this uh, kind of addresses another question well, how many visitor types can I actually address on a single page? And the answer is not going to be one or the other. I've seen as little as two, as much as five here on this page. But what I have discovered is that it's usually, um, it, it's usually paring down or maybe kind of expanding up, but there's never one type. It's, it's almost a balance. So these are different things that you can do to your page templates. Let's talk a little bit about copy changes now. So we talked about making changes to the templates, but what, what if you're a marketer that doesn't have time to make the templates, you've got uh, 10 things in your design and development queue, and the only thing that you could really test or change is the copy. Well, the good news is that we've discovered some things here as well. Uh, but first, let's take a look at some foundational principles. The mind is the great lever of all things, uh, said Daniel Webster, and that the human thought is the process by which human ends are ultimately answered. And uh, this brings up an interesting point. Uh, I think uh, Robert McKee said it best. It, he, uh, he's got this principle of antagonism. He's a, a great screenwriter and editor, um, one of the world's uh, best, actually. And one of the things that he discovered in part of his writing, in part of his analyzing and, and editing of um, thousands of screenplays, is that human nature is fundamentally conservative. And when I say conservative, I don't mean politically. I don't mean kind of in a value standpoint. But what I really mean, and, and, and actually what he means, is that human nature, a human is not going to do something that they don't believe is going to be in their, either their best interest or is not going to hurt them. They're not just going to do something um, just that easily. They've got to see the value in it. And thus comes in the mind. How can somebody willingly do something harmful to themselves and allow it? The mind. He, uh, a great quote, the mind is a machine that turns negative things into positive things. That mind uh, can do the same thing about kind of tearing apart negative perceptions and making it more realistic. Uh, I like to think of it this way. <laughs> 
I don't know if any of you are fans of bungee jumping, but I'm not. <laughs> this is one of the things that is not on my bucket list. I do not want to do it, okay? And I can't understand for the life of me <laughs> why other people want to do this kind of thing. But you know what? They, they do. There's a lot of uh, people that, that like this thrill and whatnot. And um, as I was searching for reasons why somebody would put themselves in harm's way, <laughs> yeah, if no flint, don't jump, uh, is is, uh, well, I, I found one gentleman, or at least one man, that thought there were five good reasons. First one was overcoming a fear. Uh, if you go naked, it could be free. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that one. Uh, cross an item off the bucket list. Bragging rights. And then my personal favorite, it's safe. <laughs> I, uh, are, you for, are you for real? I mean, is this serious? Yes. But I, I promise you, they didn't come to this conclusion just out of the blue. They didn't just wake up and say, oh, this is what I've concluded. I'm going to do it. It takes time. And we've got to realize that as this lever of the mind moves in degrees, the sale kind of reflects that in that it moves in stages. The marketer has to match the message to the stage. So how do we do that? We've got to synchronize what's on the page, the geography, with the chronology. For example... Just look at the search terms. Just look at all the wide variety. Here are a couple samples. They evidence just all that's happening online. And you've got every stage of the buying process almost coming into your site at different points. So what do you do? If I'm writing copy, how does this relate to copy? How does this help me write better copy? Well, if you're going to enable that type of synchronization, you've got to align it with two things, or one of two things, or both different stages in the buying cycle, and then two, relevant, distinguishable categories of interest. They need to be immediately distinguishable. Purple, pink, okay? If I did two shades of purple, I might have confused my daughter. They had to be two or three different shades. Otherwise, you create a stopgap in the mind, and they pause, they hesitate, and some may leave, some may get confused. They've got to be distinguishable. Well, how did this reflect in the experiments that we ran? How does this reflect in the copy? Let's take a look. So from the original experiment, here they had three columns. It was supporting column, right? Um, what if all they could do is change these three? Well, you take a look. You've got news and research and then are you candidate. Maybe one of those three seems relevant, but we oftentimes like to talk about the things that we're excited about. Um, and this is natural, but we forget that other people aren't nearly as excited. So what do we do? We rewrote the copy to focus on relevant topics, and here's the interesting part. Those topics coincided with stages of the buying cycle. So if you're interested in this topic, then actually you're interested in this stage of the buying cycle, and et cetera, et cetera. That helped us get that 331% gain. That was a huge part of it. And somebody asked me, what are the most common copywriting mistakes? That is it. It's that we focus too much on what we want to talk about and not enough on what the customer wants to talk about. Here's another example. We did a follow-up test where all we did is we changed just this one area here that you see. We wanted to see if it was possible to attract more of a given prospect type just by changing the copy. That's it. The result? 49.5% increase in clicks. So it's possible. If you just change the copy to align with what the customer's thinking, what's relevant to them, where they're at in the buying cycle, look at this. You've seen specialists and neurologists for your chronic pain. You've been to the emergency room. You've tried all of the treatments. You, they're just building that connection with every line of copy. And that's what you need to do with your pages. Here's another example. Um, this is a really interesting one. Here's a, kind of an event software platform, um, and they offer a software that caters to each of these different audiences, but it's still one software. And this was a copy from one of their main landing pages. We ran a test where all we did is we changed the copy from this to this, okay? So you got from an individual prospect kind of product focus to a general in which they can continue to kind of choose their thing. The initial result was interesting, 20.6% increase in conversions, and that was with all traffic. But we didn't stop there. We took a deeper look at the data as part of our certification process here. And what we discovered was this, is that each of the copy for these two had a dramatic difference 
on the different channels. So they actually had partner sites that introduced them to the concepts that they were talking about on the right, and they, they already knew that. They were ready to get into what's in it for me as a runner. And that actually beat out the one on the right by 32%. And then for the group that was coming from Google that had no idea what the software was about, they're just kind of looking for a solution, that helped them connect. They just didn't need that much content. And because the aggregate of these two separate gains outweighed the main gain, they set up dynamic pages. That's another option that you have where you can use technology, right? But in some cases, you can't. But just a simple copy change can make such a difference. Let's look at one final example. Do you remember this page? We looked at it, okay? This was kind of the Google-style treatment. We'll take a look at the winning treatment real quick. Notice that we had three sections, and if you could read French, <laughs> then you could understand that dernier voyage trouve sur l'île de that's terrible. Uh, Pamela would uh, totally get rid of me for that. Um, that actually is copy written for deal seekers and browsers, right? So like uh, flights that you could get tomorrow at a discount, okay? The other two columns are value proposition, uh, kind of like little special offers and things that come with it. But just having a section for those people, even though it was evenly weighted, resulted in this, uh, this kind of a difference in search volume. So uh, let's kind of put it all together with a final experiment. Here um, we've got a, a subscriber only kind of, I guess you could call it a social media site. It's almost like a forum, advanced forum designed to provide fast, easy access uh, to expert advice specifically on IT, like very technical subjects. So these are people trying to solve problems for something very specific. Um, in order to access it, you gotta be a subscriber. So they wanted to increase subscriptions and the revenue associated with it, like the subscription length and kind of the, the premium versus standard. Let's take a look at the page. So this is what somebody would see. They'd type in their question, and um, then they could have access to all of these kind of expert comments and existed solutions, right? But when they clicked on that, this is what happened. In the control, they would get a popover, and then that would take them to the order page. <laughs> What's really interesting, based off of the data that we have on this test, is that Regardless of which one you chose, uh, it, the page really didn't change, at least visibly, to the customer. There may have been some CRM uh, changes or a, a kind of a API changes in the back end. But our team said, what if we did a treatment where we eliminated the popover, eliminated a click, decreased friction, so we could get them straight to the page? I mean, there is an option for corporate uh, and uh, if you take a closer look for corporate, it's kind of like in that small area right next to the uh, orange arrow. There is an option to go corporate. So here are the two side by side. What were the results? The treatment did not win. Even though uh, it significantly decreased the friction of getting there, just the, perce the perception of I'm getting something for me, or I'm getting maybe a, a corporate discount, just that perception is making a difference on the behavior. So we can't just simplify, we have to clarify. So let's do a quick review. We've got five minutes left. Here's some of the key points. So John, uh, what can I do? What are you leaving me with? Well, remember, we're not after simplicity. Simplicity is a tool, okay? It's a tool to help us get to clarity. And when I say clarity, I'm talking about the prospect's understanding of the offer. That's what powers somebody up the funnel. So in order to do that, we can make three types of changes to our page templates. We can optimize the number of conversion paths, okay? So we can find common denom denominators among our prospects and then choose the number of paths based on that. We can ensure that there's a subheadline or headers that are used to guide the visitors so that they can quickly understand and find that relevant piece of content. And then finally, we can sequence the content so that they can connect to that section as soon as possible so they feel kind of the, a single flow of the conversation. Now, okay, what about copy changes? I can make uh, design pages and I can do copy. What would I do? Align the copy with either the stage in the buying cycle or relevant distinguishable categories of interest. It can't be equally weighted in the mind in any form. It's got to be separate in the mind, even though it's equally weighted on the page. 
Um, if you're looking for a template, are there any effective templates for managing multiple customers? Then um, this is where you can get it. Go to our research directory on marketing experiments. We've got a lot of free research there and click on page templates that work, published in July. We actually have a template that addresses multiple prospect numbers and kind of how to take these principles that we've extracted and really kind of expanded uh, and sort of apply it in a template format. And if you're uh, wondering how you can conduct research with us, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about how this process works, how we find these, get these findings and come upon them, um, I encourage you afterwards, uh, when you leave your feedback, just select the Research Partnership Opportunities box. Our team will get in touch with you and kind of answer any questions that you have about that. With that, let's go into live optimization. One more thing, uh, we've announced the email awards uh, for our Marketing Sherpa Mech Labs kind of competition, so I just want to encourage you to check that out. Let's go to our first page. So here we've got a CV check. And uh, it seems like they've got private, primary audiences, individuals, and HR managers. So we have at least two groups of people coming to this page, right? Audience, tell me what you would do based on some of the findings that we've had today. How would you help this group in uh, kind of getting the maximum response without isolating any particular group? Audience, I'm waiting for your feedback. Okay, we see, I see the comments coming in. All right, excellent. Um, my, my team is telling me that we're short on time. We want to get at least another one in, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, provide some feedback. So if you're CV check, I want to say you do have some things working for you. If we could scroll down a little bit, uh, Luke. Some things that you've got working for you is your template. You've got, um, you've got three sections to connect with these different groups. And you've kind of got a primary section. It does kind of look like a banner ad, but it's not so bad that they might completely miss it. But here's where I, you may be finding trouble, is that you've got all of these kind of call to actions over. You've got two here, and then down here, you've got two each. So if somebody wanted to engage in any one of these conversations, they wouldn't know which one to choose, or they might be confused on which one to choose. And they might even not even get this far because you're forcing them to make a choice right here, and then it's rotating. Um, what would I suggest that you test? I would suggest testing a static headline, and a static subheadline that was very instructional. And then in your three sections, um, don't just leave it so general. I would almost kind of find a piece of content or find something that aligns with each of those groups, something that each of those groups would find incredibly valuable, and then give them one choice in that conversation. So if it's to get that piece of information, it would be to do that. If they're really seriously ready enough to get started, which is something that I would also question and hypothesize that they wouldn't, you could leave it there, but otherwise, uh, something that's not as commitment heavy. Expand upon the three columns that you have, write more. Do less in the introductory column, just get them there, and uh, at that point, you may be able to maximize your response. Let's take a look at one last one real quick. Um, I'm, running, I'm out of time, I wanna just quickly do this. Sherman College, primary audience is students and alumni. So now we've got two different groups of people. They want to send visitors to the proper area. Uh, we just had a couple examples of some educational sites. And what I can see here is if you take a look at these bottom columns, and it looks like, uh, yeah, if you could scroll down for me. Each of these columns is focused. You've got, I could see some potential here. Is it right for you to visit the campus, the chiropractic health center, driving directions and the deadline, those three columns don't necessarily connect with me. They might connect with existing students, but you could almost kind of, you might be able to categorize all of that into one section. Plus you've got that area, if you scroll up, apply now, request info, visit campus, that's adding another layer of confusion. So if you, if you um, what I would do is you uh, work on the template here. Uh, try to uh, find the optimal number, maybe it's two, maybe it's three columns, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say four based on what I've seen in the library and find a way to re kind of uh, apply this section that's adding a lot of additional confusion because I'm not sure which one to go to. And then finally that banner, uh, especially if you stayed with it, um, that might need some optimization as well, but really focus on the template and then finding content for three of those four columns that's gonna better align with uh, some of the, you know, the alumni 
uh, persp- you know, and also the current students. Uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, uh, really uh, looking forward to uh, another live web clinic. And um, again, if you're interested in learning more about how we do the research or see if you're a fit for the research, then I encourage you to let us know, fill out the feedback form, and we'll see you next time.